great to see you in the presence of the Lord. What a great spirit is here in this house today. And I thank Pastor Matt asking us to travel down from Baton Rouge and visit you again. It's so good to see many of you that I've met over the years and some of you I have not met yet. Um, but uh, after this morning, we can not any longer say we're not acquainted. And of course, the guest of honor is always Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, please, with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For the last several year, um, weeks, I've had this passage in my heart and my mind, and I spent yesterday trying to put it together for you today, and I'm still uh, struggling somewhat with the direction of it, but not the text so much. It is not my job to figure all that out. It's my job to present it and trust the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us as we go. It's nicer, and Pastor Matt can attest to this one, it all's lined out and ready to roll for you before you get here. But sometimes the need is God will give it to you as you go. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let's just read the first four verses of chapter 3. Paul the Apostle would write to the church at Corinth, the church he founded, and say, And I, brethren, and that indicates that he's talking to saved individuals, both men and women. He's not treating them as underlings. He's treating them as brethren. He said, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now, this church had existed at the time of this writing approximately for five years. For 18 months, Paul the Apostle himself had taught and labored in the church of Corinth. After he left, Apollos, who was one of the greatest speakers of the first century church, knowledgeable of the doctrine of the new covenant, came and ministered for a period of time. And so they weren't without solid teaching. They weren't without the beginnings of what is needed to establish faith and what was needed to establish a wonderful, strong church. But Paul is now concerned because he said, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, meaning that somewhere along the line, the growth of this church that had all the advantages to begin with had begun to be something other than what it needed to be, that the growth could be thwarted. And can I say to us all that we need to be very careful because growth, no matter how wonderful it starts, can be hindered. Yes. Amen. Okay, I'll preach over here. It can be stunned. Yes. It can be hurt in not just some of us, in all of us. Yes. We have to be very, very careful. Uh, and Paul is now speaking to them, not as a judge, not as an overlord, but as a brother that's concerned. He said, verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. The natural growth process, as you all know, those of you, especially mothers in here, you know that when the child is born, liquid is all that they can take. Milk is what they start with. But as the child grows and as the child matures, then they're prepared for stronger food. The digestive system, the digestive tract, everything in us is prepared for something that will build us into a stronger individual. And spirituality is the same issue. We have to not only have the milk of the word, but we also then have to advance ourselves into the meat of the word. And we're going to talk about that today, but it has to be done carefully. Paul said that somewhere along the line, the church here at Corinth had never gotten away from milk. And it might not be what you think it is as we look through it today. Verse 3, for you are yet carnal. When he says this, he's not trying to insult them. He's trying to show them something. To be carnal or fleshly means that... If I'm a believer and I am still acting carnally, it means that I'm thinking and acting and responding like someone who has never been born again, like someone who has never been saved. 
See, when we're born again, and we'll talk about this, a powerful change takes place. You cannot be born again and stay the same. It, it's not. If, if you didn't have changes going on on the inside of you when you got saved, maybe you need to take a quick look at that event. Amen. Because there's no way that the way that God has designed it, you can be born again and not be changed. Right. It's an impossibility. Right, right. But the problem is that not every way in which we think and not every way in which we live and not every decision that we make is necessarily stemming from the influences of the new life that is within us. Amen. Sometimes we're shaped and formed by things that we have learned prior to our salvation. And those ideas and those thought patterns don't always disappear the moment we get born again. Come on, man. Come on somebody, Amen. help me. Amen. We still have some aspects of thinking and evaluation. And if we try to live for Jesus the same way that we uh, have lived in this world, by the same means, trusting in the same mechanisms, going back to the old processes of dependence on self or what we know or things that aren't in God's outlay of planning, then we can become carnal. We're thinking about things in the wrong way, in a way that not is it's not designed by the Spirit and by the Word in the New Covenant. And therefore, we become carnal. He's not talking that you're not saved. He's talking to us about the thought processes that we have that are hindering us from moving from the foundational truths of Scripture through to where we can graduate into being a more productive individual, not only in our own walk with the Lord, but in our own walk with other believers and other Christians. And I dare say there's not a one of us that hasn't found themselves in a little carnality. So this isn't just for them. Or them. This is for us. He said, for you are yet carnal. And then he gave evidences of carnality, even though there are many, he gave this. For whereas there is among you envying, <coughs> jealousy, why does she get to do? Why did pastor say that to him? Why did they elevate? Okay, I'm not. <laughs> Whereas if there is envying, and envying will always bring strife, strife, quarreling. I can't do it like Bob Cornell did because he had two hands. <laughs> but when we find ourselves quarreling, the scripture tells us the Apostle Paul would say that the servant of God must not strive, right, right. must not quarrel, right. but be patient, Hallelujah. apt to teach, yes. in meekness, instructing those that are opposing themselves. Why? So that the Lord himself might move in that heart, move in that life, and reveal the true need of the individual. So if we're envying and jealousy is present if we are quarreling among ourselves. <coughs> chances are carnality has been influencing that. And the biggest one of all, are you not carnal and walk as men? Verse 4, for while one saith, oh, I'm of Paul. And another says, I'm of Apollos. If you read chapter 1 of this great book, and chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 really deal with all of the same subject. They didn't just argue about Paul and Apollos. They also included Cephas, who was Peter. Well, we know Paul was a pastor there for a period of time, and he spoke to the lives and the hearts of the people. 
And Apollos, a great orator, was there for a period of time. He spoke to the needs of the people. We don't know that Cephas had been there, but perhaps he had. Uh, Peter uh, had been there. If not, there were those that had sat under the, his party. And some even said, well, I just, I, I like Jesus. So either they had heard Jesus preach or teach in his in his physical ministry, or they were the spiritual type that wouldn't listen to anybody else's preaching. They just got their message from Jesus himself. Help us, Lord. The problem is, whenever we start claiming to be a part of a group, we're no longer an active part of the body. When it's just about me and we and them that looks like me and we, me, we, and them. It's me, we, and them. I'm right. a Apollos group. Right, right. Let's take it home right. where we live. I'm from Crossway Ministry. <laughs> right. I'm from SBN. I'm from Family <laughs> Worship Center. If you don't look like me, talk like me, walk like me, wear what I wear, worship what I worship, do what I do, then you're just not qualified like I am. Carnality divides the body and makes men the priority. And we're not the priority. Yeah. Never. We must never be the priority. Who are we if we are, in fact, true called God, called, called men and women to proclaim the message? Who are we but messengers, listen, by whom you learned to believe? So when the focus gets on me or we or them, it's not on Him. Amen. And he is the one that delivers. He is the one that saves. He is the one that died. Did Paul die for you? He would ask in the first chapter. Did Apollos die for you and rise again? No, my friend. In order to eliminate carnality, let's take a look at this text and ask ourselves, what does it mean to be carnal? What causes carnality in a Christian? And what is the cure? How do we eliminate this from our own lives? And before you start thinking, oh yeah, I wish so-and-so was here, this message isn't for her, or, you know, it's for you. <laughs> it's for all of us. Every single member of the body of Christ. And if you're not a member of the body of Christ and you're here this morning, we can fix that in just a moment. So this morning I want to minister, if you'll allow me for a few minutes, carnal Christianity, carnal Christianity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit and the lovely presence of the Spirit that we sense here today. I ask that you would lead us and guide us to do no violence to your presence, to do no violence to your word. Anoint us to speak and preach. Let the true preacher and teacher come and let him administer truth to the lives of those that are before us and maybe even to those who watch later by recorded device. We thank you now in the name of Christ Jesus and everybody said amen. 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 The problems in Corinth were many. When Paul writes this, historical facts point to the idea that he has attempted to fix this problem of carnality in several ways prior to the writing of this epistle. There's some that even believe that he, after founding the church, heard of some of the divisions and the splits and the fact that there were what some scholars refer to as super apostles. Super apostles showing up and the people loving the, the status of a, being connected to a super apostle began to hear and began to concentrate on something that wasn't conducive to their growth. Not every message you hear, not every preacher that you listen to or that you might think is proclaiming the gospel proclaims the gospel. And again, some of the clues that we've talked about uh, if you find them amongst yourselves, that is evidence of carnality. That is evidence of a wrong direction. 
And the super apostles would come in and they would attack the foundational truths that Paul laid out. And so Paul, in an attempt to turn it around, made what we believe is a painful visit. He even went there himself, and the people were so enamored, this church that he started and founded, were so enamored with the super apostles, they kicked him out of town. Wow. Wow. Get out, Brother Matt. We don't need you. And they call that the painful visit. And so he retreats and writes one letter that's rejected, and then we think this is probably the second letter, trying to correct this church of Corinth. And anybody that knows sports, if you'll allow me the illustration, any time that a great team gets off track, what a good coach always does is he takes the team back to the basics. If it's football, we have to learn how to how to tackle again. We have to learn how to block. If it's basketball, we have to learn how to shoot. Now, I don't mean to be carnal, uh, but I'm bringing you an illustration. Anytime you get off track and you're good at what you do, a good coach, a good minister will take you back to basics, and that's exactly what Paul did. Because it's leaving the basics behind in an inappropriate way that sets up the opportunity for things to come in that shouldn't be. And so Paul would go back and he said, don't you remember when I first came to you, I didn't preach anything but Christ and him crucified. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 23, he says, we preach Christ crucified. He said, uh, I ministered to you on the power of the cross, not on baptism or divisions, because the power to change and the power for salvation and the power to be set free is all ensconced in the message of the cross. So Paul, when he writes Corinth to correct the carnality, reminds them of the basics. And he said, let's take a look at Christ and him crucified. Well, what does he mean by that? He meant that I was determined when I came into town, when I first met you, I laid the church down on this foundation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yes. That Jesus Christ came from heaven. That Jesus Christ lived a perfect, sinless life and then offered himself as a sacrifice, as payment for your sin. I didn't preach anything else. I didn't preach the gospel of Paul. I didn't preach the gospel of Jerusalem. I didn't preach the gospel of Crossway Ministries or Baton Rouge. I preached Christ and him crucified. Why? The power of the gospel does not operate. The work of the Holy Spirit does not operate when we start lifting up another methodology for salvation outside of Christ and what he's done. The only way for men, women, boys or girls to be introduced out of the life of sin's domination and into a life of freedom and liberty is for somebody somewhere to stand up and say there is only one means of salvation. There is only one way. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father but by me. Jesus died on Calvary to pay the penalty for your sin. And if you believe that, see, the uniqueness of that message is that when preachers preach that, God the Holy Ghost backs them up. God the Holy Ghost, who is now in the atmosphere because of what Christ did for us at Calvary, reproves men of sin, convinces them of their sin and of judgment and of righteousness. When the preacher preaches the cross, the Holy Spirit starts to draw. And men have to be drawn to the Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you can talk someone into being a Christian, someone else will come along and talk their way out of it. 
But when you preach Christ and the cross for salvation, then the Holy Spirit moves and the truth of convicting power hits that individual. They see themselves as a sinner and something inside of them says, I don't know why I believe, but that a Jew 2,000 years ago hanging on a couple of slats of wood out of Jerusalem died. Millions of Jews died over the years in Jerusalem. But one in particular, if you'll place your faith in him as the Son of God who loves you and gave himself for you, that you can be forgiven. You can become a new creation. You can have your sins washed away and every effect of the fall can be eliminated from your life as a result of your union with this one. All God asks us to do is to believe. And when the preacher preaches and faith cometh, remember, faith is the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit that causes you to, first of all, see your need, and then secondly, makes Jesus real to you. You didn't think that came from your cerebral hemorrhaging, did you? It wasn't the three brain cells we had pumping together that finally figured it out. It was a move of the Holy Ghost. And the only thing that brings the moving and operation of the Holy Ghost is when somebody lifts up the simple, basic gospel of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. And the moment that that's done, then the power of the Holy Spirit begins to draw. And every single one, and listen, every single one, who says yes to Jesus is instantly, listen now, recreated. Soul and spirit. Baptized into Christ. Crucified with him in the mind of God. Buried with him and raised up with him to live in him. And receives a brand new power source. And it ain't at and <laughs> or some power company, it's the power of the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, moves on the inside of you, and you become the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are justified, you are sanctified, you are set apart for God, you become a member of the body of Christ. All through, listen, all through the process, listen, all through the process of faith and grace. The only way that you get saved, the only way that you get changed is that somebody preaches Jesus Christ to you and you hear it and faith is actually created in you and you operate on that faith and God, when he sees your faith in his son, does the work in you that you could never do to yourself. Right. Welcome to the new covenant. Yes. And it only happens when somebody, it doesn't matter who it is, man, woman, boy, or girl, lifts up Jesus. His blood is enough. His blood is enough. Let me say this to you because one of the problems that we're having even now at the message of the cross is divisions that have started to surface elitism that has started to raise its ugly head. Right, right. Now, what I'm going to say, some of you will balk at, but I want you to attend to it scripturally. Every person that lifts up Jesus Christ and him crucified as the only means of salvation is preaching the cross for salvation. Amen. That's right. That's right. Every single person who is pointing to the fact that Jesus and Jesus alone is the Savior of the world is preaching the message of the cross for salvation. Some of you, before you met Pastor Matt, before you went to Ohio Bible study, before you heard anything from anybody, you got saved. You were genuinely, genuinely changed by the power of the truth of the message of the cross. You were born again, and you knew you were. That's right. And that, 
has great value. Amen. That's right. So before we throw away all the other ministries in the world That's right. That's right. that are lifting up Jesus Christ as the exclusive way of salvation, let us be very, very careful. That's right. Are we concentrating on me and we and people like us? Have we become spiritually elite? Then we are carnal. Yes. That's right. Amen. Amen. Oh, I'm preaching better than you. Amen. And we have become carnal. Because it's not about us, it's all about him. That's right. That's right. So we have got to allow, there are people all over the world that don't understand what I'm about to explain to you as the second layer of the message of the cross, if you will. But the message of the cross for salvation is seeing people saved all around the world, even now. Yes. And people that don't understand the proper growth process the same process that your pastor is teaching you. And I have found in the midst of, and I've been preaching this 25 years, pastor, going to places here and there, here and there, and it breaks my heart to see that some have decided that we're the only people worth having on the planet. Wow. <laughs> that spirit is not of God. That's right. That's right. That's right. It is a carnal, evil spirit of division and schism mm. that focuses on me. If I preach about what I preach about more than what I preach, I'm preaching me and we and not him. Amen. Come on. You following me? Yeah, yeah. If I'm preaching that I'm preaching and no one else is preaching what I'm preaching, it's just me and I'm preaching, I'm kind of like, Elijah, oh Lord, I'm the only one. No one else is around. And Jesus, or God speaks to Elijah. He says, hey, dude, I've got 7,000 people that haven't bowed and ain't the girl. You don't know. Put that line in your active. So before we become the big me, 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 the big I, let's be really careful. Yes. And let's acknowledge the people that are doing a good work to lift up Christ yes. as the means of salvation. Amen. 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 Yes, we become carnal. Now, secondly, if we're ministering the message of the cross for salvation, we're, mess we're ministering the message of the cross for sinners. But Paul doesn't just emphasize the message of the cross for sinners. He extends this message of the cross to saints. That's right. Well, you mean the same message that saved me is the message that will mature me? <laughs> exactly. Oh, mundo, bright one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's it. God doesn't oversimplify. He's oversimplified this have you looked at us lately? Right, right. Good. Have, have you really looked us over good? <laughs> We're a bunch of dummies. Yeah, yeah. God had to keep it simple yeah. so that everybody could get it. That's right. He didn't complicate it. Right. Here's the process. When we preach Christ and Him crucified for salvation, then every preacher, and I would, every preacher on the planet needs to be also saying that the only means to growth Proper growth, freedom, deliverance, strength, understanding, knowledge, peace, joy, victorious living is the same object of faith required as your salvation. You don't need to take a path over here, and you don't need to take a route over here, and you don't have to recreate what God has already done. The blood. Amen. Is enough. Come on, somebody. The blood is enough. And when I, as a minister of the gospel, direct your eyes to the one who loved you and gave himself for you, I am giving you the answer for your anger, for your jealousy, for your lust, 
for your lack of peace, for your lack of finances, for your lack of abundant life on every level because only God the Holy Ghost can fix you. I can't fix you. But if the message of the cross of the saints directs the object of their faith to who Christ is and what Christ has done, and then the God who lives inside of every born again recreated believer goes to work on you in a way that no man ever could. Amen. That's right. That no man, because there's no, there's no event, there's no category of process outside of faith in Christ and Him crucified. Yes. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. So I would that every single person who does not understand the message of the cross for saints, for ongoing growth for victorious living would learn it. Yeah. Well, how are they going to learn it? If I'm Mr. Stuck Up with my nose in the air, you're not good enough to talk to me. How are they going to ever, if I don't go to where they are, you know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9? He said, in order to save some, see, he already knows in advance that not everybody that he's going to go to is going to listen to what it means to preach the cross. Preach the cross for salvation for sinners. Preach the cross for ongoing growth for the saints. He knows that not everybody's going to listen to him. But he says, I'm a servant. Can I just ask you to please, in the body of Christ, escape carnality by being a servant? Can I just ask you to be like Paul and say, I'm a debtor. I've been given something yes. free of charge. I've got something that works. I've got something that's so wonderful. I've got something that is powerful. I've got the truth that will change you. I know what's better than anything you could ever pay for. And you get it for free because Jesus already paid for it. And everybody can have it. But I know that there will be some who won't listen, and I know there will be some that won't embrace it, and I know already before I go, Pastor, there's going to be some that are going to shoot me down. But here's who I'm going to go to, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 21, he said, I'm going to go to the Jews. Oh, the Jews, yeah. And then I'm going to go to those that still are embracing Mosaic law. And then I'm going to go to the Gentiles. they got no law at all. And then I'm going to find every believer who's been saved, who doesn't know how to grow, who doesn't understand their liberty properly, who are weak, and I'm going to saddle up the law next to them because I'm a servant and I'm a better to do this. Carnality says I'm better than you are. I can't go next to them. Oh, good God, it'll get on me. Well, if what the world has gets on you, you ain't got much. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God, the Holy Ghost, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. What can he do? What can he do? What can he do? You ain't got no problem bigger than dead and buried. And the Holy Ghost who lives in you is already dealt with, dead and buried. So I'm going to go to the Jew. I'm going to go to the legalist. I'm going to go to the Baptist. I'm going to go to the Presbyterian. I'm going to go to the backslidden Pentecostal community. I'm going to go out to the charismatic community. Let me rub shoulders because I've got a story to tell. I've got a truth to proclaim. I've got something to declare to the nations. That your answer, what you seek, is found in the cross. The answer for what you seek is found only in the cross. And I already know I'm going to be criticized for going somewhere that doesn't look like me, talk like me, walk like me. Amen. I'm not going to go to every church that has Crossway Ministries on the sign. That's right. I'm not going to go to every church that allow me to speak in tongues. You mean you would go to it? Yeah. 
Amen. Right. Give me the opportunity to talk about Christ as he crucified. Give me the opportunity to present the truth of what changes lives and maybe some of the chains of this fundamental carnality that surrounds the church yeah. can be broken. Yes, Amen. Sir. Yes, sir. But I already know that most people aren't going to go for it. And I've been grieved in some of the churches that I've helped plant that we now have an elitist idea regarding ourselves. That, my friend, is evidence of carnality. Yes, sir. And carnality hinders our growth. It stops us from just believing in Jesus because our minds and hearts are redirected to another thing, to another process, to another way. And most of it is just all about me. Oh, and, and maybe sometimes I'll look at other ministries that are successful and uh, that green-eyed monster. Not money. Jealousy. Starts to rise up. And so now I want to belittle that ministry that is having success because they've got to have compromised to us because they're not as important as me. Carnality takes on the thinking of humanity that's not saved. Bigger is better. No. The size God intended you to be is perfect. The location God has set you in is perfect. The ministry God has given you is perfect. But it's not. And you should be proud of your ministry. You should love your ministry. You should love your pastor. And love the leadership in it. And pray for them. And trust them. And walk with them. I watched this morning. The way that these, are, and it's developed over the years where you're now praying for each other at the drop of a hat. And I think that's precious. We need each other in the body Amen. of Christ. Amen. And you're exhibiting that. That's a part of what we are. The place you are in, in a local <coughs> church, wherever. The Bible says that God sets the solitary in families. A local church is a family. Amen. It's not your source of deliverance. No. Come on. Jesus and yes. Jesus and faith in him and what he's done is your only deliverance. It's your only freedom. He's your only liberty. Why would you take your eyes off of him when he's got everything that you need? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I love him, but he ain't in. You can love me. I hope you do because I'm because I'm because I'm such a nice guy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Four years of training her and I can't get it out. I want you to love your leadership. Yes, yes. But your leadership didn't die for you. Yeah, yeah. The right. church didn't die for you. Amen. Jesus. So he's the only one deserving of my adoration, my worship, and my faith. Love the brethren and pray for your leaders. Strengthen their hands when they get discouraged. Stand with them. They're not always going to make every decision perfect because they're human. Guess what? They're just like you. <laughs> and sometimes we're learning and we grow and we go and we learn. But know this, that when you're connected to Christ, he won't give up on you. Amen. He won't stop working. The only thing that will stop him from working and allow carnality to enter is when you leave the foundational truths of what it means to be saved and what it means to grow. Because he only operates by faith and grace. And your faith has to be in what he has offered yes. and nothing else. And then grace for the journey. The delivering, strengthening, enlivening power of the Holy Spirit 
rises up with it. You don't need me for that. You just need me to point you to the one. And when we come together and, you know, as I said, pray for each other, you're not counting on me to lay my, your hand, my hand on your back. You're counting on that person to come alongside you That's and appeal right. to Christ on your behalf with yes. you. That's right. Right. Somewhere along the line, Corinth left the foundation. And instead of growing as they ought to, they became carnal. They began to operate in the world's wisdom. Chapters 1 through 4 of 1 Corinthians is basically Paul telling the church, are you going to follow man's wisdom or are you going to follow the wisdom of God? Don't become carnal. Envy, jealousy, divisions, schisms are all evidence that carnality has taken place. What, what causes carnality could be misguided zeal. Man, we love the message of the cross, therefore we're the only ones, and we can only be the only ones, and this is the only message that counts, and we obscure our minds as to how many ways that God might work. Misguided zeal. It's not wrong to be zealous in the right thing, but be careful that your zealousness doesn't take you into carnality. A heightened evaluation of the truth, you know. There is no other way to salvation and growth outside of faith in Christ and in cross. Christ and the cross. But when I use that truth as a bludgeon, a club, to beat other believers over the head. I am not of the right spirit. That's right, that's right. Carnality surfaces again because I am I am more important. I'm making my am I making myself clear? I'm more important. I'm we have and you don't have. That's not how God treated you. That's right. Bruce Wagner said it a long time ago, and I guess I've just I've stuck with the thought that we should treat each other the same way that Christ has treated us. Amen. Amen. He never gave up on me, and Pastor, there's been a few days I gave up on me. <laughs> oh, but Brother Larson, no, no. It's all about our faith in him. There's a few days I did some things wrong. No fair interviewing my wife, who's cute and sitting in the front row. <laughs> he never quit. There's a few days I almost, I think, at times might have wandered into faithlessness. You ask yourself questions like, am I an idiot? Is this really true? Okay, I'm the only idiot in here. <laughs> but he didn't, he didn't, here's my point, he didn't move away from me. That's right. That's right. Treat other people in the body or outside of the body in the same way that Christ has treated you. If you really understand the message of the cross for growth, one of the things that becomes evident is a love for God but also the love for people. Yes, sir. And it tears down the walls that separate us. Now, let me say this. Paul also taught us that there is no other foundation that any man can lay. So while I'm accepting of the body of Christ, I have to be careful how I build on that foundation. Not everybody is preaching the right thing. You have two safeguards within you to keep you from getting off track. The Word of God and the Spirit of God living in you. Do you realize that for the first 1,500 years of the church, the only real thing that a believer could rely on is the Spirit of God inside of them, guiding them as to what was right and what was wrong because the modern availability of the Bible didn't exist? How are you doing on that learning the voice of the Master? 
How do you do one on? You know, you might need to shut out some of the other voices. Amen. Oh, well, I like CNN. I like Fox. I like this. I like that. Oh, don't throw Democrat, Republican at me. I'm talking about learning the voice of Jesus. Yes. 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 That's right. We can Instagram ourselves right out of the gospel. Come on. Yes. We can two Facebook ourselves right into. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm not against social media. I use it for the purposes that I use it for. But we can become dominate by other voices that are contrary to the simple way and word of Christ. And not everyone who picks up a Bible and waves it or points to it is preaching it accurately and exegeting the passage and telling you what the author said. You need to be very careful. So while I'm accepting of the body of Christ, I'm not accepting of everything that I hear preached in the body of Christ. I have to, to guard myself against carnality. I have to be careful how I allow truth or truth so-called to be laid on top of the foundation of Christ and him crucified. That's right. That's Everything right. connects to that foundation. God never changes his processes or ways. It's always done by faith and grace. And when your faith is becoming deeper and grace is becoming more preeminent then a love for each other and a love for the lost and a love for the body will begin to surface. Not sectarianism, not elitism, not I'm better than you. That's evidence of carnality. A true understanding of the message of the cross doesn't accept everything that comes down the, the pike. We're not supposed to be blown about by every wind of doctrine, everything somebody says. We should look closely at the scripture and say, can I find that in here? Is that example in here? Is that taught in here? Does the spirit bear witness to it? I've got those two safeguards. So I can't just, while well, I'm accepting of people, I don't accept everything that people say. I can't. But how I treat them matters. Because the truth that I have is so powerful, I know it can change them. And I know that even when I sacrifice my reputation to go to them, they might not receive it. Sounds to me like the Apostle Paul, who was given this truth first of all. It worked such a work in him that he was ready to have people misunderstand him. When he comes back to Jerusalem on his final trip there that we know of, he goes into the temple because James says, hey, everybody's hearing you preach against the law. You preach that we shouldn't follow the law. I want you to show everybody that you still think the law is good, righteous, and holy, and pay the cost of these four guys that are, have made a vow, and that was expensive, and go with them in the temple and go through the cleansing process. And once you do that, then we'll listen to what you have to say. Mm. Wow. And Paul says, no problem. Can I tell you something? This message gives you liberty Amen. on such a level you can do almost anything that's not against God. And Paul was in such liberty he was not afraid to rub shoulders with people that didn't understand so that he could have the opportunity to say the only delivering power that exists is faith in Christ. And that's because Paul was a recipient and partaker of the message that he preached. And it burst such a love for people in him that he didn't care about. And even today, and your pastor can tell you, you get the commentaries and read them. Oh, Paul didn't do the right thing. Paul didn't do the right thing. Paul didn't do the right thing. And you'll be criticized at times too. Am I saying you belong everywhere? No. Am I saying be with everybody all the time? No. I'm saying be able to rub shoulders with people and Amen. share the gospel with anybody, anywhere, at any time because you yourself have become a servant to share the gospel that is changing you. Yeah. And the failure to do that is carnality at its, at its height. 
So how do we cure carnality? Well, I'm going to give you the same answer that I started with. We have to put aside malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and slander. And if the message of the cross is working in us, that is available to you. There's nothing that you have in you in an attitude or an action that cannot be resolved by faith and grace. You have to recognize it. Say, whoops. That's modern version of repent. Whoops. Lord, forgive me. Lord, I need this eliminated from my thought process, from my spirit, from my heart. And I know that only grace can do it. And Jesus died to set me free. And he will. Amen. And then there will be said of us what Jesus said. They shall know you are my disciples because of your love one to another. The true love is not being birthed in you by following the right message. Then you're not following the right message. Not acceptance. Again, I balance it. Not acceptance of everything and everybody, no matter where they are, but a willingness to share your faith with people. But there's a truth that I want you to know. There's a depth to the message of the cross, both in salvation and sanctification, that we have not plumbed. Right, right. You can keep going deeper and deeper. There's more to what you now know if you've been built on the right foundation. Amen. We've been preaching this to the body for 25 years and I feel like I'm just getting started. Just letting him start working in me in the measure of what he wants. Because I found myself in that same evil sense of elitism, Pastor. I found it. I saw it. And it wasn't a pretty picture. Yes, help us, Lord. But I know that that's not the, that there's, there's more than just the fact that I preach it. There's more than just the fact that I belong to. There's more to change me. Right, right. To make me more into his image. More to conform me into him. I can go deeper in the message. There's things about the message of the cross I still haven't realized, still don't know. And for the rest of my life, I'm going to get into digging deeper. And if I ever happen to hit the bottom, then I got a reverse course and I'm going to start going up because the message of the cross can take you all the way up to heaven. And like Paul, I have not attained. I have not apprehended. Neither am I perfectly mature. But pastor, this one thing I do. On the foundation of Christ and him crucified for salvation and Christ and him, and him crucified for sanctification, I press by faith for grace that I might be changed into his image and one day when he comes back to take me home. I want to find him, I want him to find me fighting that good fight of faith and believing him for the next thing that I need to see happen in my heart, in my mind, in my spirit, in my life, and in my ministry. And if I'll stay humble and dependent and reliant on him, then carnality doesn't have a chance. Oh, love. Of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. Now I find your key. Today, I'm just going to say to you, I've tried to bring you my learning, my growth, 
in this message year by year by year. This year has been a very important year. Don't become carnal. You have the foundation. Your pastor has given you the foundation. I know him. I know what he teaches. But there's not a one of us that doesn't need to take heed how we build upon that foundation. There's not a one of us that doesn't need to look closer at what that truth can develop and free us from and transform us into because it's all that God has given. Christ and Him crucified, faith and grace, the power of the Holy Spirit, it's enough for everything that you need.